Good evening, everyone. It's an honor for us to have at Abralino Online this evening, Professor Fernanda Ferreira. Uh, Abralino Online, Linguists Online, is a project which was launched last year. And it's been very successful. It's been done in cooperation with several linguistics associations worldwide, such as the CIPL, the Comité International uh, des Linguistes, the ALFAO, Association de Linguistica e Filologia de America Latina, La Sociedad Argentina de Estudios Linguísticos, the AILA, La Association Internacional de Linguistica Applique, the LSA, Linguistic Society of America, and several others. Professor Fernanda Ferreira hardly needs a presentation. She's a very well known psycholinguist, psycholinguist and in her lab, she conducts uh, research taking advantage of insights from formal linguistics, phonology, and syntax to develop models of sentence processing and uh, language processing in general. Uh, she is going to talk to us today um, about the good enough language processing. It is about meaning, not syntax. It's such an honor to have you, Fernanda. So you can turn on your camera. Okay. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight, Fernanda. So the word is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for this invitation to speak. Um, this uh, amazing lecture series has been, uh, you know, there's been so much buzz around it over the last year. You've invited some amazing scholars to come and give talks. And um, I think that it's just done a real service to the community by bringing people together at a time when we've all been, uh, let's say challenged somewhat <laughs> by situations and circumstances. And I think you've done a, a huge amount to make linguistic research um, accessible. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. And it's, <laughs> and it's especially meaningful to me to uh, be part of this um, Brazilian initiative. As I know many of you who have organized this are aware, I have some close family connections to Brazil. I have lots of relatives, primarily in the Rio de Janeiro area. And um, that makes me feel very close to all of you and to this initiative. And also, of course, we were really fortunate to have had um, Dr. Miguel Oliveira as a visiting scholar in our lab a few years ago. And we all really enjoyed working with him. And we hope we can all be together in person again sometime in the future. But with all of that, I will now um, begin my talk. So I'm going to share my screen and, okay. So let me just um, make one, oops, make one small change here. Um, there we go. Um, oops, no. Okay, so you can see the presentation. Okay, great. All right, if I'll, I'll assume that you can't if I hear some sounds as I'm presenting this. Right, so um, it's okay. It's okay, great. Okay, so um, yeah, so here is the title of my presentation. And um, before I start, I, I want to make sure because sometimes at the end, you know, uh, sort of, say, I, I want to start this talk by acknowledging my many collaborators, the people I've worked with over a couple of decades on this topic um, at many different universities, people who are in um, many different countries at various stages of their careers. Um, all of them have been really influential in my thinking about good enough language processing. And I'm really happy to have one of them um, here today, uh, Kyle Christensen as the, um, who will be a discussant for this. So um, these are the people who I've been working with and some of their names are going to come up during this presentation. Okay, so for today, what I'm going to be doing, what I'm gonna do is, um, first of all, lay out a sort of a conceptual background to the idea of good enough processing that helps to motivate the core ideas. These were, um, features of the language system that I began to think about a lot, a little bit more than 20, or I guess about 25 years ago, um, I was doing sort of very traditional and I think very fun and exciting psycholinguistic research, but 
in the back of my mind, there were aspects of language that I thought we weren't paying enough attention to. And uh, that conceptual background helped to lay the foundation for what we now call the good enough approach. So I'm going to go through some of that. And then I'm going to talk about some of the evidence that inspired the idea of good enough processing. So this is work that was done not by us, but findings that were around in the literature that were consistent with the idea of good enough processing and helped us to develop the framework and develop the experiments that we would test, that would be, we would design to test the framework. Then I'm going to talk about the good enough approach itself. And finally, and not finally, but then I'll, I'll get to a critical paper that provides some of the core findings that are linked to the good enough language processing approach. And that's the paper that Kyle Christensen is the lead author on um, titled, evident, um, titled Thematic Roles Assigned the, Along the Garden Path Linger. And I'm gonna spend a fair bit of time on that paper because we published a lot of experiments and some of the findings are well known and get a lot of discussion. Some of the findings have um, received a little bit less attention, but I think they're worth um, highlighting because they address some of the issues that have been raised about the good enough language processing approach over the years. Then I'll get into the sort of core of the presentation, which is this question of where, what is the, when people misinterpret the, the sentences and the, the linguistic input that they're given, what's the problem? Is it that the syntactic structure is defective or is it some kind of, or is the, the reason for the misinterpretation something that's attributable to processing related to meaning and generating semantic representations from syntactic structures, which are themselves intact and following the principles of the grammar. Um, I'll very briefly talk about the misinterpretation of non-canonical structures such as passives, but the focus of this talk is going to be the misinterpretation of garden path sentences specifically, um, simply in the interest of time. Then I'm going to try to um, put it all together and, um, sorry, that last bullet point shouldn't be there. Um, Okay. Um, and so then I'm going to be try to put it all together and I'm going to lay out some of the implications for uh, our so for our, how we think about the language processing system and the, the, the future directions for this research. So I'm going to start then with the conceptual background for this work. And I'm going to start with an assertion that I think most of us would agree with, which is that uh, fundamentally, the purpose of language is communication. Now, actually, this statement for some people is a little bit controversial. Maybe there are other things that language is useful for that people like to point to. So rather than saying that the purpose of language is communication, how about if I'll say, a purpose of language is communication. And I think that we all can agree that certainly one of the core functions of language is to enable us to communicate ideas to one another. And from this, a number of different uh, features of the language system or properties of the language system that I think are relevant to us as psycholinguists for trying to develop our theories of processing, um, these things come to mind based on the idea that the purpose of language, or at least a purpose of language, is communication. One is that um, most of the time when we use language, we're talking or we're signing um, as opposed to writing or typing. We're often in conversations. We're under time pressure. The environments in which we communicate are noisy, or sometimes at least they're noisy. Our cognitive and linguistic systems are fallible, and our interpretations are invisible to others. And I'm going to go through each of these points in turn. So most of the time we are talking or signing. And what this means is that the signal, the linguistic signal that we're receiving is ephemeral. It comes and then it's gone. And in, when we're normally communicating with people, we can't rewind them the way that we can go backwards in a YouTube video, for example. Um, and we also can't make regressions. Um, when we're reading, we can go backwards and resample the text. But in listening, we, there is no equivalent of a regression. So the only thing that we have when we uh, 
believe that we've come up with an interpretation that is maybe problematic or not quite optimal, we could ask the speakers to um, repeat themselves, um, but doing so can be socially and interpersonally costly. We might do it once, we might do it a second time, but if we're really having trouble understanding someone and we feel the need to keep asking them to repeat themselves, the social interaction, which um, after all, is what a conversation is. A conversation is social interaction. Um, it starts to get awkward. So most of us at a certain point will just stop doing that. But this is a core I, feature of language, which is that the, the signal is not something that we can go back and revisit. Uh, we're often in conversations when we're using language. And what being in a conversation means is that we're alternating being the comprehender and being the producer. So we take turns saying things and uh, listening to what our interlocutor is telling us. And what this also means is that there isn't actually a final interpretation. That is, our interpretations are being continuously updated. So in our psycholinguistic experiments, we often talk about presenting a sentence on a given trial. We uh, will refer to subjects generating an initial interpretation of the sentence and then uh, perhaps revising that interpretation. And then we, uh, we, we like to say that they obtain their final interpretation of the sentence and they move on to the next trial. That might be how things go in, in experiments, which have that kind of a structure. But in real life, our interpretations are constantly being updated. We don't normally have a conversation and never come back to it again in the future. So if we have a chat on a Tuesday about how to um, uh, uh, build, build something, if we have a conversation on a Tuesday about that, I might come back to that conversation with you on a Friday and revisit something that we talked about. And in the meantime, between those, those uh, days, between Tuesday and Friday, perhaps I've been thinking about our conversation and updating and revising the interpretation that I obtained when we were actually in the moment having a, a conversation. So what this means is that our interpretations are always being embellished and added to based on information that comes from the environment. And of course, they don't just get embellished and added to, they also become uh, distorted and they become integrated with other sources of information. When we're in conversations, we're under some time pressure. And yet we know that sentence processing in the lab can take a fair bit of time. In fact, if some of the sentences that we give to our subjects in our experiments can be so challenging that it takes the subject several seconds to understand the sentence, that is to push the button to indicate that they're ready to go on to the next trial or to answer a question about the sentence. So sometimes, you know, as many as 10 seconds are required, um, or at least that's what the subject tries to, uh, is, uh, wants to, is the, 10 seconds might be the amount of time that the subject chooses to spend uh, reading a sentence. But in normal life, we, norm we don't have several seconds to sit silently and try to process the sentence that we have just been given. So normally we can't do that because our interlocutor is producing more sentences. And uh, there's also the possibility that it's time for us to say something. It's our turn to participate in the conversation. So we can't just sort of stop for a few seconds to process the sentence that came that, that we just received. In fact, there's kind of a trade-off between the processing of the current input, um, anticipation of what's to come, and reanalysis of what came before. So um, to sort of lay this out um, a little bit more, uh, uh, more specifically, here is the kind of sentence that you're going to be seeing a lot of in this presentation, a garden path sentence like, while Mary bathed the baby. And now imagine that you, as the, uh, as the processor of this language, uh, receive the word played. We know that that word is going to trigger some, uh, some tension in the language processing system and the need to engage in reanalysis because what's, what probably has happened here is that you've taken the baby to be the object of bathed. And then when you get the main clause verb played, you have to reanalyze the baby as the subject of that main clause. So all of that has to take place. So the current 
you're so in the in the moment you're processing the verb played um, but you're also presumably engaging in prediction because we know from a lot of research that's been conducted over the last 15 or 20 years, we know that people don't just try to integrate the information that they're getting, but they try to predict what's likely to come. So in addition to processing the current input, we're predicting what's coming up. We're also planning our turn in the conversation and we're perhaps doing some reanalysis. So all of this has to happen, but all of these operations are time consuming and, and cognitively effortful. So if I think of uh, being in a situation where I'm under time pressure, I might have to truncate some of these processes. And when we ask, well, what would a rational language processing system work well, work? How would it work? I don't mean rational in the technical sense, but just a, a system that's relatively adaptive. I think that emphasizing the current input and what's to come is a better strategy than perseverating on the past. If for no other reason, then the input that comes after the sentence might help to clarify the interpretation that should be obtained. We're often in noisy environments, so external noise will often degrade the uh, linguistic signal. Um, people move around while they're talking, which causes their voice to change. There are other talkers um, in the environment. There can be environmental noise. Um, people often produce disfluencies when they're speaking, and sometimes speakers are interrupted, or you um, might and you might be listening to a speaker who's interrupted, and so it, another conversation might uh, cut in. Um, and as we're all very aware over the last uh, year and a half, um, connectivity problems associated with, say, our Wi-Fi, um, the quality of our Wi-Fi signal can cause us to uh, end up with a very degraded signal. And yet the language system has to be able to cope with this kind of um, noise in the signal. We have fallible cognitive and linguistic systems. So again, we know that speak, speakers make speech errors. Sometimes they correct those speak, speech errors, but oftentimes they don't. And when they don't, it's up to us as the comprehender to try to infer what the speaker's communicative intention was. If I say, um, please put the milk back in the stove, you will infer that I misspoke and meant to say fridge, um, even though that's not actually what I said, simply because it makes more sense. We know that speakers, um, some language users have hearing problems. Some have um, problems associated with listening, perhaps associated with um, attentional challenges. All of us have uh, problems maintaining our attention. So we all experience fluctuations in attention. So uh, I'm you know, very aware that during this entire talk, at some points you're going to be paying very close attention and getting uh, very accurate and detailed representations of what I'm saying. But at other points in the talk, your attention um, might wander. And at that point, your um, interpretations will perhaps be um, less detailed and less accurate. We also know that um, our memory systems are constrained in some very important ways. So we know that short-term memory, of course, has a limited capacity. And uh, we know that long-term memory, although it doesn't seem to have any limited capacity, it's subject to um, many biases that relate to how we're able to retrieve information um, that we need in order to obtain an interpretation of a sentence. And even if all of these things weren't true, we also know that people vary in how in the kind of language that they bring to bear during an, an instance of uh, communication and the linguistic knowledge that they have access to. So people might be uh, unfamiliar with the domain of discourse in which you're um, communicating. They might not know the vocabulary that they're using. And that lack of knowledge is going to lead some is going to result in re representations that are obviously not as rich as they could be if that knowledge um, were in place. And finally, um, we uh, have to think about the fact that the interpretations that we obtain are, for the most part, invisible. Now, part of what we do as psycholinguists is to try to figure out how to make those interpretations visible by developing tasks 
that allow us to tap into the interpretations that people are building. Um, neuroscientists have been have developed all sorts of techniques like functional magnetic resonance imaging and e, um, recording of EEG and so on to uh, try to get look into our heads and see what kinds of interpretations we're building. But all of these techniques depend on us drawing inferences about what the interpretation is based on some uh, machine signal that we're obtaining. And in fact, we're not typically called out on our interpretations. That is, when you're in a conversation with somebody and you suspect that that person didn't really understand what you said, it's not that common to say to the person, yeah, I don't think you're paying attention to me. Tell me, what did I just say then? Right? It's a little bit confrontational. So it's not something that we tend to do all that often. And even in our psycholinguistic experiments, we don't call subjects out on their interpretations all that often. We maybe don't include comprehension questions in our experiments, or we include very few, or the ones that we do include are extremely simple. And when it comes to the kinds of garden path sentences that we're interested in, it could be that the questions that we ask don't even tap into it. And one of the reasons that um, our interpretations are, it's okay that they're invisible, is that often later content is going to clear up any current confusion or uncertainty that we have about our interpretations. So we're, we can fake that we've understood somebody in the hope that what comes, what comes later is going to make clear what the person actually meant. And so all of this means that we might be uh, like we might be tempted or we might end up going with an interpretation of our language that's good enough for now. And so all of this leads to the conclusion that language comprehension in some situations is going to be just good enough, enough to get by in the current situation. So what I wanna do now is talk about some evidence that helped to inspire this idea. And the first block of evidence that I'm gonna talk about doesn't come from the traditional psycholinguistic literature, but instead comes from um, literature in our kind of, I think of this as sort of a cousin a discipline, and that's the field of text processing. So um, one finding that really struck me um, when I first learned about it is the Moses illusion. And um, I think it's an important finding that helps to motivate an idea of good enough processing. So most of you will already know that what happens in the Moses illusion is you ask a subject a question like, how many animals of each kind did Moses take on the ark? And the uh, subject who's asked this question will often respond to rather than uh, objecting and pointing out that, um, that the relevant person here is Noah, not Moses. And um, what Park and Reader argued is that what's happening in the Moses illusion is a partial matching process. Um, it's, it might see, and it might seem less than ideal, but Moses and Noah match on many features. They don't perfectly match, but that's okay. Um, a partial match process is not only common and normal, but also a necessary mechanism of our cognitive system, because in fact, none of the input we ever get is going to perfectly match the representations that we have stored in memory. So we want the language system to be able to get by with partial matches. Um, in addition, um, there was some work um, point that uh, from the text processing literature done by Otero and Kinch in 1992, showing something that I found quite amazing, which is that subjects even fail to detect outright contradictions in text. So here's an example of a little store, a, a little uh, expository text that the subjects were given on superconductivity. The subjects read these texts. Um, the font was always in the same color. And uh, in the text, they were told or, or they read that until now it has only been superconductivity has only been obtained by cooling certain materials. Um, but later in the text, it says superconductivity has been achieved by increase, considerably increasing the temperature of certain materials. So that is just a outright contradiction. And what uh, they observed in their experiment is that 40% of these contradictions were not even detected by their subjects. And when subjects were asked to recall these texts, most subjects didn't even mention temperatures, or when they did, they would mention the, the cooling. A small group of subjects mentioned both the low and the high temperatures and sort of tried to reconcile them, reconcile them saying things like, people used to think you had to cool, but now they realize you have to increase the temperature to get superconductivity. 
Very few people mentioned increasing the temperature only, suggesting that the initial uh, idea was sort of sticky um, and that there's a, we have a little bit of trouble overriding that with the later information, which in this case is, is good. Um, so, uh, so, and that's, and in a, another set of um, studies done by O'Brien and colleagues, and Brian has a whole program of research on this, um, people seem to have trouble updating their interpretations, and it takes them some time to do that. And in some cases, they've demonstrated that people don't actually update their interpretations very well. The previous study demonstrates that point, too. So I won't read this entire little story that they cooked up for their research, but what the point of the story is that um, Susan has a lovely tree and her husband thinks it should be cut, cut down, but they but she doesn't want it to be, and he agrees and he decide, they decide not to have it cut down. Unfortunately, there's a storm and that means they actually do have to cut down the tree. So then the subjects read this blue, the sentence that I've indicated in blue, all that remained of the tree was a stump, and what they observed is that subjects took 2000 milliseconds to read that sentence when they got the text where at first they would, had decided not to cut down the tree and then they had to do it compared to a condition where the story was all through the idea was that this poor tree had to be taken down. So it takes people a while to read this sentence that requires them to have updated the representation of the story. And then there were um, gra grammatical allusions that people had been talking about since the 1970s, things like this book spills a, a much needed gap, the bills that no senator voted for will ever become law, more people have been to Brazil than I have. Um, a sent these are sentences that sound okay, but in fact are kind of um, nonsensical, or in the case of the first sentence, the sentence doesn't mean what you, what you actually think it means. And uh, Phillips um, and colleagues have argued that what's happening in these kinds of sentences is that speakers are building richly structured representations as they process the sentence, but they have various ways of navigating those representations to form the relevant linguistic dependencies. And this is going to be a theme in the work that I'm going to be presenting as well. So evidence already existed showing that comprehenders' interpretation of language, um, their interpretations are often not faithful to the input. Um, I learned um, in some Twitter discussions uh, about a month and a half ago that there's even more evidence um, consistent with this idea. So for example, in one study, um, it was shown that interlocutors were completely unaware that they were trying to perform a task together and communicating about it, but their task goals were completely misaligned. Um, another study observed that pedi pediatric interns overestimate the effectiveness of their handoff and communications that they give to the next shift that's coming on. Um, a third to a half of subjects in another study didn't realize that a conversation that they were in, this was a texting, a conversation that was being done by texting, that the conversation that they were in was repeatedly being crossed with a conversation that was completely unrelated to the one that they were having. Um, and even more surprising to me was in an, a, another study from the same lab, um, subjects were talking about things like, would you rather live in a tree or a cave? And after about eight minutes, a confederate simply said, color the screen ideas, sleep furiously. Um, and the detection rate for that odd sentence was at chance. Um, so all of these sort of points suggest that there is a fair bit of missing, uh, that people are missing the fact that they are not communicating effectively with each other. They're not getting accurate and detailed representations of the meaning of each other's utterances. Okay, and now I'm going to just briefly go through some psycholinguistic hints and evidence that again, led us to the idea of good enough processing. I've already mentioned that it can take a long time to understand a garden path sentence and that we often don't have that kind of time. In addition to that, we already had some hints of poor comprehension for garden path sentences. 
And rather than spend too much time on this, I'll simply point you to the fact that these percentages correct for sentences in the Frere and Clifton study where subjects either got a garden path sentence or a non-garden path sentence are not particularly high. But let me go to this next study that I think makes the point even more clearly. And this is a study done by um, McDonald, Just, and Carpenter in 1992, where what they did was to give subjects easier sentences like the experienced soldiers warned about the dangers before the midnight raid, or a garden path sentence, a reduced relative, like the experienced soldiers warned about the dangers conducted the midnight raid. And we know that this kind of sentence is very difficult for people to process. McDonald et al. included comprehension questions in their study, and in fact, they asked people to identify who was doing the warning. And in the case of the reduced relative, it's not the soldiers. Um, to say that it's the soldiers who were doing the warning would be, um, to, would be an incorrect interpretation of the sentence. And what you can see is that for the main verb cases, the percentage error rate was fairly low, around 10%. They also divided their subjects into low, medium, and high span subjects, um, or, or just low and high span subjects, to see what, what effect that had on um, their processing of garden path sentences. And what you can see is that error rates are fairly low for the uh, easy sentences, but for the more challenging sentences, um, and notice now that the y-axis has changed a little bit, what you can see is that particularly for the low span subjects, subjects are essentially a chance in their interpretation of the sentence. And even the high span subjects are making errors a third of the time. So that's pretty low uh, accuracy for um, for college students to understand, for their ability to understand these sentences. And the low comprehension rate was at the, uh, so the low accuracy rate was obtained whether the sentences occurred in isolation or whether they occurred in helpful contexts. So unfortunately though, few studies actually up to that point, up to the point where we started working on good enough processing, um, assess comprehension at all, at all, let alone measure whether the garden path interpretation was successfully revised. Now, before I get to our studies where we did do that, I just wanna go to one more point, which is um, a repair model of reanalysis. So I've been talking about garden path sentences and that's the focus of this talk. An important feature of garden path sentences is that they have to be reanalyzed or at least most of the time they have to be reanalyzed and various models of reanalysis have um, been proposed. In a model that was developed by um, Fodor and Inui, they um, argued for a model that they called attach anyway. And in the attach anyway model, the basic insight is that you're going along processing a sentence and I'll illustrate this with an example. And when you come to a point in the sentence where you are garden path, what you essentially have is an ungrammaticality. And the attach anyway model of reanalysis says just put that word into the uh, phrase marker as best you can, put it somewhere, create an ungrammaticality, and then set about step-by-step step trying to fix that ungrammaticality. And you'll see why this is relevant to good enough processing in just a moment. So let's take an example of how the adjust, um, the attach anyway adjust process would work. So imagine subjects get the sequence while Mary bathed the baby. So they process the sentence up to this point and they have made the baby the object of bathed, which is the you know, very sensible thing to do given all kinds of considerations. But now they get the verb played. And at this point, the parser is going to experience some distress and unhappiness because the parser has a complete clause and suddenly here's a verb and uh, there's no subject for this verb. So what should the parser do? Well, attach anyway says, just put that verb into the tree and try to fix the problem. Try to, to, to diagnose what is causing the ungrammaticality. Well, what's causing the ungrammaticality is that we have a verb without a subject. Now, what we could do is here's an NP, what if we stole this NP from the subordinate clause verb, uh, for, from the subordinate clause and its verb and made it the subject of this main clause. So we could uh, do that and that would 
fix the problem. Now the verb, the verb played has a subject, we fixed that ungrammaticality. But now, of course, we might have just created a new ungrammaticality if, for example, based were an obligatorily transitive verb. Fortunately, it isn't, and bathed can occur without an overt object. So we um, check to see whether it can occur without a ver an overt object. We check its lexical semantics. It can. But now what has to happen is that the verb's interpretation has to change. If Mary bathed, Mary's not bathing the baby. Mary is bathing herself. So the initial interpretation that was constructed where you assume that Mary is bathing the baby the, that meaning has to be um, inhibited or erased because that's the wrong interpretation. And then a bunch of other stuff has to happen so that ultimately you get a proper syntactic structure for the whole sentence and an interpretation that reflects that syntactic structure and the bits that you constructed along the way that were actually inaccurate, those need to be removed from the representation. And the idea is that the reanalysis process could get truncated at any of those repair stages, leaving you with a sentence that has only been partially reanalyzed. And that truncation could occur maybe because uh, the subject just gets bored and just wants to go on to another sentence. Or in, um, normal con in normal life, it could happen because the speakers moved on to saying something else, or you realize you need to say something, and you don't have time to execute all the reanalysis processes that are necessary to go all the way to completion. So now this brings us to thematic roles assigned the, along the garden path linger. And in this study, we um, wanted to test these basic ideas, and we did it by giving people sentences like, while Bill hunted, the deer ran into the woods. And in that sentence, you presumably will take the deer to be the object of hunt. When you get to ran, you realize that verb needs a, sub needs a subject. So the deer needs to be made the subject of running and hunting is uh, the hunt, the verb hunt is being used intransitively. So we had um, a version where the deer was running into the woods, and then we had a version where the deer was brown and graceful, and that lengthening of the ambiguous region we knew from previous research would make the garden path more severe. We also had what we called plausible and implausible versions, and this is plausibility with respect to the initial misinterpretation. So for a uh, built to hunt a deer that's running into the woods, that's plausible with respect to the interpretation that they shouldn't get of the sentence. Whereas hunting, that if the deer is pacing in a zoo, it doesn't make sense for um, Bill to be hunting that deer because we don't hunt animals that are in the zoo. So those are all the four, uh, these four are the, were the garden path conditions that we gave. And then we had the non-garden path versions where we simply provided an overt subject for hunted, in this case, the pheasant. And so the deer is simply running through the woods. And uh, we have both the short version of the deer and a long version of the deer. And then the, the independent, the dependent variable in the study was simply subjects answers to the question, did Bill hunt the deer? And what they, sh they should say no in response to that question. Now, you might already be thinking, and people, including our reviewers at the time, said, well, people could be, it's possible that Bill is hunting the deer. Yes, it is. But the question is whether it's more likely that you think that he's hunting the deer when you have also been, uh, when you have built the syntactic structure that supports that interpretation. So that it's not just a plausible inference on the basis of world knowledge, but rather is an interpretation that you're clinging to based on having built the syntactic structure that supports it. And I'll get to how we um, address that concern in, uh, as we continue talking about the experiments. So here are our results, and this is the percentage of incorrect responses. And this is the version where P, where the deer is running through the woods, and these these are garden path the garden path sentences. These are the garden path sentences where the deer is pacing in the zoo, and these were the non garden path controls. And the question again is, did Bill hunt the deer? And what you can see is in the non garden path conditions, people don't make too many errors. Um, they make more errors in the garden path condition, particularly when the ambiguous phrase is long and the interpretation would be plausible. That is, the deer is in the woods rather than being in the zoo. But now something that um, often gets forgotten about these experiments is we also ask subjects to rate their confidence 
in their answers, because some people have suggested that perhaps subjects are just really confused about these sentences and they're guessing. But in fact, we asked subjects to indicate their confidence on a scale from one to four, where four meant that they were supremely confident. And what you can see is that our subjects are confident in their interpretations. In fact, they're more confident in their, um, garden, their interpretations of the garden path sentences than the non-garden path sentences. They think they got the answer to the question correct. And uh, I'm not showing it here, but their confidence in their wrong answers was just as high as their confidence in their right answers. So we also varied the position of the head of the ambiguous phrase. So instead of giving them um, uh, a version where as Harry chewed, the steak fell to the floor, we lengthened the phrase by making it the brown and juicy steak versus the steak was brown and juicy. And the reason that we did this is because we had reason to think again, based on previous research, that it's not just the length of this phrase that matters, but rather the position of the head of the ambiguous phrase with respect to the disambiguating word in the sentence. If they're close, the sentence is easier. If they're far apart, the sentence is harder. And in addition, we had as the control version, instead of uh, uh, including the extra noun phrase, we simply reversed the order of the clauses where there, now there's presumably less temptation to think that Harry is chewing the steak. And we asked a question about both the main clause of the, about the subordinate clause, did Harry chew the steak? And also about the matrix clause, did the steak fall to the floor? And what we um, observed is that when you ask subjects about um, the matrix clause, did the steak fall to the floor, whether people are garden pathed or not garden pathed, they make very few errors. So they understand the main clause of these garden path sentences quite well but they're still confused about the uh, subordinate clause, about whether uh, Harry is chewing the steak. And you can also see that, the, um, that they did worse when the head of the, of the ambiguous phrase was distant from the disambiguating word versus when it was close together. And again, we got confidence ratings and subjects were very confident of their responses even when they were wrong. And then we also looked at verbs like bathe and the verb um, bathe is an interesting verb to use because it's reflexive. And as I mentioned before, when I was talking about the Fodor and Inui model of reanalysis, when you get the verb bathe and you realize that it's being used without an overt object, you don't end up with an interpretation like you do for hunt where, yeah, he's not hunting the deer, but he's hunting something. Uh, and it could be the deer. In the case of bathe, if you're not bathing the baby, then you're bathing yourself. And it's got, a re, it's got a specific reflexive interpretation. And what we showed in these experiments, whether we used a control condition where we reverse the order of the clauses or we used a comma, we either way, we find that people are um, answering incorrectly if they've been garden pathed. And what that tells us is that this is not just about a uh, pragmatic inference. This is about a pragmatic inference, yes, but that is being strongly reinforced by having built the wrong syntactic structure for the sentence initially. Okay, so what we've seen is that subjects think that the, that the man hunted the deer or that Mary bathed the baby 30 to 75% of the time. That is, they're misinterpreting this sentence. The longer they're committed to the wrong analysis, the stronger that misinterpretation effect is. The plausibility of the overall interpretation affects the likelihood of, of inhibiting the wrong interpretation and getting the correct one. And the verb type doesn't seem to change that misinterpretation effect. People are not confused about what the subject is of the main clause. That is, they um, answered questions about the matrix clause or the main clause um, very accurately. Um, and people are confident in their answers even when they're wrong. In fact, there is no difference in their confidence ratings for their right answers versus their wrong answers. So that's what we got from the, the what we got for in our initial studies. Um, the next question that we wanted to address is whether the misinterpretations are due to a failure to repair the syntactic structure or a failure to properly update the interpretations that are incrementally um, derived from it. So for for this experiment, and this is work that IELTS did with Kyle Christensen, along with Tim Slattery, the lead author, Patrick Sturt, Masaya, and Masaya Yoshida, 
And what we decided to do was to um, use a syntactic test for intact structure in order to assess whether subjects successfully reanalyzed the sentence. And that, um, that syntactic test is the C command um, relationship. So if we take a reflexive like herself, um, in the sentence, the girl loves herself, the antecedent of herself is the girl. And this, the, for, the reflexive has to find an antecedent in what's called a C commanding position. And for our purposes, we can just think of it as, um, a, some, as something that's sitting in the subject position. So if we take a sentence like, after the manager telephoned, David's father grew worried, what we have is a garden path sentence, just like the ones I've been talking about. After the manager telephoned David's father, it seems like David fa David's father is the object of telephone, but when you get the verb grew, you realize, no, that's not right. David's father is the subject of grew and telephoned is being used intransitively. Now, what if the sentence keeps going and there's a reflexive in that clause? This reflexive has to have an antecedent and that antecedent has to be in a C command position. It, it's a, again, it has to essentially be the subject of that clause. If it isn't, if the, so the subjects haven't reanalyzed the structure so that they've made David's father the subject of, the, of this main clause, then they're not going to find an antecedent for the reflexive. So uh, that's, and, and you see that here where David's father is a subject and so it can see command himself. Well, you can't really see it because I'm not, I haven't drawn the tree, but David's father is the subject. And so it is um, suitable as a, an antecedent for the reflexive. So what we did in our experiment is to give subject sentences like, after the manager telephoned, David's father grew worried and gave himself three days to answer. And in the other condition, the critical condition, we uh, still had the reflexive himself, but instead of David's father, it's David's mother. And this mismatching antecedent should give people trouble when they hit the reflexive himself. So the idea then is that the logic of the study is that the parser would be unhappy about this reflexive only if it had successfully reanalyzed this ambiguous noun phrase, either David's father or David's mother, as the subject of the main clause. That was our sort of test for whether they had built a syntactic structure. So what we did was to ask subjects to read these sentences on the eye tracker and we monitored their eye movements and we looked at their reading times on uh, the uh, disambiguating word. So the sentence goes, after the bank manager telephoned David's father or David's mother grew worried and gave, and then the, the reflexive himself. And uh, there was either a comma, if the comma was in the sentence, then it wasn't a garden path sentence. That's our control condition. And we're interested in reading times on the verb grew because that just tells us if, whether there's a garden path effect. If we don't have a garden path, we then, you know, that's the ticket to sort of playing this game. We need to have a garden path effect. Um, often it spills over into the next region. We don't really care about this part of the sentence, but we care very much about what's happening on the reflexive. And what we want to see is whether people are unhappy with the reflexive himself when they have the antecedent mother, but th because they'll only be unhappy with the mismatching features if they have successfully reanalyzed this NP as the subject of the main clause. And so here um, I'm going to just be graphing out the results that we obtained in one of our reading time measures. Um, and what and so first the disambiguating word of the sentence, we want to see a garden path effect. And you can see blue are the garden path conditions, red are the non-garden path conditions. And so we've got a we have a garden path effect. We have a huge garden path effect. Um, and it persists into the next region as it often does. But now what happens when we get to the reflexive? Well, when we get to the reflexive, the garden path effect has gone away, but we, and we're left with simply a mismatching uh, uh, features effect. So people are spending a longer time reading himself if they received um, mother versus father. So they're sensitive to the features of this um, antecedent, which then indicates that they have, in fact, reanalyzed the syntactic, syntactic structure sufficiently to make that NP the subject of the main clause. 
So although the readers were clearly garden pathed, they were also bothered by the mismatching reflexive. And what this demonstrates to us then is that the syntactic reanalysis that the subjects engaged in was sufficient to support reflexive binding. Now, at this point, um, around the point where um, Eugene Huang came into my lab, and I'll mention, um, I'm, I'm, the, but the point where Eugene Huang joined my lab, we realized, wait a second, there's something sort of problematic about the logic of this study. A limitation of the study that I've just talked about is that we actually didn't probe the garden path interpretation. So I had been talking earlier um, in this presentation about the importance of including comprehension questions and assessing whether people got the right meaning of the garden path sentence. Well, we didn't do that. And so it's possible that what subjects actually did was that they sometimes were garden pathed and on the trials when they got the question, remember that the, the um, for people don't get the question wrong 100% of the time, they get the question wrong between 30 and 70% of the time. So it's possible that the mismatching reflexive effect happened only on trials when subjects got the question right. And because we averaged those trials, we mushed it together and we can't actually conclude that even when that even when subjects get the question wrong, they have built the right syntactic structure. So Eugene Huang and I decided to address this limitation in a study that was um, just recently published. So what we then did is essentially the same uh, study as Slattery et al, but we conditionalized um, the uh, eye tracking data on question answering accuracy. And in fact, we did one experiment that was eye tracking and another quest, uh, experiment with self paced reading and replicated the results. And um, to do this experiment, we had to run far more subjects. Um, we ended up running, I believe it was about 120 subjects because we were going to divide our data in half. Um, we also knew from previous studies basically how to get a 50% accuracy rate on the questions, which would allow us to divide our data into two um, halves, which is very uh, convenient for doing this particular um, analysis. And we also had um, uh, quite a few more items in order to increase our power. So here are the results that Eugene and I obtained in our eye tracking study. And these are first pass reading times. And this is for all trials. So this is with yes and no responses. So trials on which people got the question right and trials on which people got the um, question wrong. And uh, what you can see is that on the disambiguating verb fell, we have a garden path effect. And on the reflexive, we have a mismatch effect. So it just replicates slattery at all on all trials. The question is what happens when we separate the data? And what you can see is on the correct trials, we see a very similar pattern. The data are a little bit noisier because now we just have half the data, but we're seeing a garden path effect on fell and then a mismatch effect on the reflexive. And we have the same thing on the incorrect trials, a garden path effect and then a mismatching reflexive effect. So um, what this then tells us, sorry, what this then tells us is that even when people got the question wrong, they still built the right syntactic structure because they still have a C command relationship that they can use to get an antecedent for the reflexive. And when that turns out to have uh, features that they feel are mismatching, then it takes them longer to read the reflexive. And I want to point to one other uh, finding, and this now takes us back to the Slattery et al. study, which is that we had a semantic test for the lingering interpretation. So for the idea that what's going wrong with these um, in with good enough processing, the reason people are misinterpreting the sentence isn't that they have built the wrong syntactic structure, but rather that the initial misinterpretation is lingering in memory and interfering when they go to answer the question. Here, we're not using questions. We have an implicit measure of whether the initial misinterpretation lingers or not. And there have been uh, uh, various criticisms raised suggesting that the reason that we get these effects is because of the question that probes the interpretation. And fair enough, it might actually exaggerate the effect. But in this study, we don't have questions. Instead, we're giving people sentences like, 
While the baboon groom, the chimp at the zoo was being photographed, we expect the subjects will treat the chimp as the object of grooming and then have to reanalyze that when they get to was and make the chimp um, the subject of being photographed. And then the baboon is grooming himself or herself. Then they get a subsequent sentence, and this is our implicit test of whether the misinterpretation lingered. They get a sentence like, the baboon finished grooming himself and climbed up a tree and out of sight. So this subsequent sentence assumes the correct reanalysis of the previous sentence. It assumes that people have built the, uh, the previous interpretation. And we have a version where there's both a comma after here or no comma, and the comma is the control condition. And we also have the version with tiger, where presumably they're much less tempted to um, persist or even build perhaps the garden path structure because you don't know, a baboon would probably not want to be grooming a tiger. And what we found in the study is that subjects indeed took longer to read this blue sequence when there was no comma in the sentence, so when they were garden path, and when this uh, noun phrase was a plausible direct object for the subordinate clause verb. So they're taking longer to read the, the sentence, the sequence that's given in blue, which is the correct, which assumes the correct interpretation of the sentence only in the version where they have been garden path, that is, there wasn't a comma. And what that tells us is that the initial misinterpretation was lingering in memory and leading to the longer reading times on this particular sentence. Okay, so the subjects, what we found in our work that we've done since the paper thematic roles assigned along the garden path linger is that we can see that subjects are being clearly garden path in these sentences, but they're also sensitive to a mismatching antecedent for a reflexive. And this sensitivity doesn't depend on answering the comprehension questions such as, did Mary bathe the baby correctly? They, they show the sensitivity whether they answer the question right or wrong, whether they get the question right or wrong. And this suggests that reanalysis is sufficient. So the reanalysis processes that we can think of in terms of, for example, um, attached anyway, um, that those processes ran to the point where the NP from the, uh, from the subordinate verb was that NP, which looked like an object, was indeed made into a subject for the main clause. And this is true even when the sentence is then misinterpreted. That is, they get the question wrong. However, we don't yet have evidence that the subordinate clause has been properly syntactically analyzed. That is, what we've shown is that that ambiguous noun phrase has been taken over by the main clause and made it subject so that now that subject NP is sitting in a position where it can see commander reflexive. We haven't yet actually provided positive evidence that the subordinate clause has been properly syntactically reanalyzed. And that we hope is going to be um, a project for that we're, we're in the stages of planning that project. And we've also shown that the initial misinterpretation is lingering even into the following sentence, much like what the work that we saw from our, our friends in the text processing world who have demonstrated that when you get an interpretation of a story or some expository text, it tends to stick, it tends to um, have some, it tends to be tenacious. And by the way, there is some evidence from the processing of filler gap dependencies for the same kind of idea. So this is work by Fujita and Cunnings. And what they did was to give people sentences like, Alyssa noticed the truck which the policeman watched the car from earlier that morning. This isn't a garden path sentence, although it might kind of feel like one. But what happens in the sentence is you get, Alyssa noticed the truck which the policeman watched. You assume that the policemen are watching the truck, but then you get the car from and you realize that the policemen are watching the car from the truck. So the policemen are in the truck, in other, word, in other words. And so in, this, um, ex in these experiments, they showed that with both online and offline measures, that the initial misinterpretation associated with the incorrect filler gap assignment, that is where the policemen are watching the truck, lingered even though the filler gap dependency itself syntactically was successfully resolved. So our conclusion is that good enough effects are attributable to incomplete semantic cleanup, not to incomplete syntactic reanalysis.
And what about misinterpretations of things like passives? Unfortunately, I'm already starting to go over time, and I do, so I don't have time to go into this. But um, Nene Shantavaran did some lovely dissertation work on um, misinterpretations of passives and other non-canonical sentences, suggesting that mis misinterpretations arise due to the presence of a competing schema-based meaning. So you misinterpret the dog was bitten by the man, because there's a competing interpretation in long-term memory where dogs bite people, and that's what leads to misinterpretations. But unfortunately, that's a body of work for another talk. Okay, so putting all of this together, we've seen that the syntactic parse can be right, but the interpretation can be wrong. Um, and this is encouraging, I think, with respect to the robustness of the syntactic system, because it suggests that the parser is it's, it's strong. The parser tries and usually succeeds at getting the syntactic structure right. It's a little bit discouraging, though, from the perspective of how syntactic structures and interpretations align, because what we've shown is that they can diverge. So you've got one syntactic structure for the sentence, which is the one that represents the global form of the sentence, but you've got an interpretation for the sentence that doesn't actually reflect that syntactic structure because you built these other interpretations all along the way, and they're sticking around and interfering with the interpretation you derive ultimately from the intact syntactic structure. And so, yeah, so why do we get this different divergence? Because there are sources of meaning other than the one that's derived, derived compositionally from the global syntactic form. There are meaning bits that get activated incrementally, as well as meanings that get directly retrieved from long-term memory. So for our future directions, what we would like to do is to, as I mentioned, demonstrate that the subordinate clause indeed lacks an overt object. So what we've shown is, again, that that ambiguous NP moves over to the, well, is sitting in the subject position of the main clause. We haven't actually shown that the ambiguous noun phrase is no longer in the subordinate clause. It's possible that that ambiguous NP is being shared by the two clauses, which would be kind of syntactically weird, um, but is a logical possibility. Or maybe the parser made a copy of that NP rather than moving that NP to the other clause. So we'd like to um, see if we can uh, choose between these possibilities. Um, we want to in investigate some other in constructions. You heard a lot today about the subordinate main construction. Um, mainly because it has some useful properties that allowed us to get going on this the research program. But there are other constructions that rely less on, say, comma disambiguation and prosodic disambiguation. And these would include things like reduced relative clauses, coordination ambiguities, and so on. Um, many of you might have noticed and might even be um, preparing questions about the fact that our model assumes a serial parse that gets repaired with the interpretations being derived from the initial parse and the reparses. But we haven't actually pre presented any direct evidence for serial parsing. And so um, an interesting project might be to think about how all of this might work in a model that's more um, more parallel, maybe probabilistic, so that people are building multiple structures in parallel, but um, based on the probabilities of different forms that are likely to occur, and how we can think about these data in that context. But for now, I will simply acknowledge that we have been working with a model that assumes a, a, single, a single syntactic structure that gets built and fixed, um, rather than multiple structures that get selected, depending on the um, how the input unfolds. <clears throat> and um, the last sort of future direction is that we have um, recently developed a proposal for good enough language production. And this is work that I've done in collaboration with Adele Goldberg. And so for that, um, that project has um, progressed fairly far. And so I hope you'll be hearing more about it in the near future. So please stay tuned for that. And so that brings me to the end. I, I just want to now thank my lab. Um, this is a picture. Um, Miguel will recognize the location where we took this picture. Um, he was in one of the earlier versions. Um, this is my current lab, a picture that we finally got to take together um, after the pandemic. Um, uh, 
sorry, the pandemic is not over, but at least once things became a little bit um, less grim than they were and we could be together. Um, I want to take, thank my um, sources of funding. And I also want to thank the University of California, Davis, my Department of Psychology, my colleagues in linguistics for all their support and um, inspiration and ideas over the years. So um, thank you very much um, for your attention. Thank you very much for such an inspiring talk. Very good. Thank really you. Impressive. You've been working, engaged in this program for several years and it's still uh, very nice and interesting ideas. Um, people are thanking you very much, a lot here in the YouTube chat. And uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, let me read them for you. So Gitana Bezerra is saying, so interpretation may be good enough, but not syntax. How do you see the idea of syntactic under specification, considering the discussion that we see in Suites et al. 2008, and, and also in the constru construal hypothesis, for example? Right, so that's another, that's the under specification was another piece of our, um, good enough processing story that I, you know, in the interest of time, I didn't go into, you know, I haven't gone into for this talk, but yes, the questioner is absolutely right that another claim that we have made um, is um, inspired in part by the idea of construal. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the construal hypothesis that Fraser and Clifton developed says that for some phrases in particularly what they call non-primary phrases, mm -hmm. you can sort of think about them as modifiers that, that may, may keep, well, certain kinds of, mod like relative clauses, for example, that these um, phrases, rather than being attached into the tree, interpreted and then, you know, the, the interpretation revised if necessary, that instead, sorry, I'm just fixing something here. Okay. That instead, the relative clause just gets um, associated with the, um, with the with the um, phrase structure and interpreted based on semantic information, and yeah, in the Sweats et al. study, um, oh sorry, are you, uh, did I did I just, Marcus? Do you want me to put my view back? Oh, if you like, yes, or maybe okay. it would be useful. Yes. Okay, um, let me. Um, all right, I'll put it back. I often just get rid of it because it's many of us find it a little bit you know, tiresome to look at ourselves when we're giving a presentation. Um, but right, so in Sweats et al, we decided to test this idea and we found some evidence for it. And um, I think that the link to the good enough processing hypothesis that again is a little bit different from the experiments I talked about here is just that, um, is that the parser rather than engaging in the effort that it would require to definitively attach um, say an ambiguous relative clause simply decides to um, leave it floating and to try to interpret it later when maybe some disambiguating information comes in. So um, I hope I've understood the question. If I, that I think that based on how I interpret the question, the mm -hmm. idea is that the, um, the, the notion of construal and of under specification are part of the good enough processing story. So this and the structure, I guess the question that the, maybe was also being asked is how do we reconcile the site with the idea of an intact syntactic structure? And I guess we just have to think a little bit more about what, what the nature of an intact syntactic structure might be. Is it legal for a phrase not to be definitively attached into the tree, at least at some points in processing. So yeah, it's something, yeah, that I need to think about that a bit more. Okay, thank you very much. There's still another question here uh, from Hailing Hao, um, who asks, what's your thought on the underlying cognitive mechanisms for good enough processing? Is it due to memory constraints or noisy chain, uh, channel interferences? So, um, so let's talk, I'm not sure that it's an or in those cases. I think that both could be um, 
you know, at work in these misinterpretations. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of the memory processes, because I think memory processes are part of what's happening in noisy channel um, interpretations or interpretations that are based on the idea of, of noisy channel. Um, I think that what is good, so the memory, so yeah, the memory system is fallible. We build an interpretation based on the initial syntactic structure and it looks reasonable. And then we get some disambiguating information that forces us to change the syntactic structure, um, reanalyze it and build a new interpretation that might not be consistent with the one that we built before. In the case of hunting, they're not inconsistent because hunting in, you know, an unspecified object is compatible with hunting a deer, but, hunt, but bathing a baby and bathing yourself, those are two you know, different acts. And those interpretations are living in um, your working memory system. And, uh, the, and I, I think part of what we might um, assume is that we're not perfect in terms of our sort of source memory here of knowing which interpretation is associated with which syntactic structure. So we get confused. In addition, there might be memory processes related to primacy. And we've already seen from the, we saw right way with, in the case of the text processing study that people um, are, are kind of more likely to stay with the first thing that they, um, that they were told rather than updated information. So they, the, and that might be part of the reason why the initial interpretation based on the incorrect syntactic structure tends to stick around in memory. So those would be some of the memory processes, the cognitive mechanisms as the questioner asks that I think are um, at least a, a big part of the story um, for why people are getting these misinterpretations, which is why we don't think that it's that they're um, not bothering to build a syntactic structure. We can explain these effects with, mm -hmm. based on mechanisms we already have independent evidence for. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like just to note that uh, Professor Q. Christensen is also here. We're mm -hmm. so glad to have his presence here. Professor, would you like to please turn on your camera and take part in the conversation, the discussions? That would be a pleasure for us an honor first. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, there are still a couple of questions, but I have a question myself. <laughs> so we like to. Um, here's a, and I'm Kyle, gonna... you should join in. <laughs> All right, we'll do. You can, you yes, can see me please, okay? Yeah. Please join in. Okay. Very good. Very good sound and image. So uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Antonio Ribeiro and I did some, uh, he was a PhD student of mine we tested uh, L, uh, late closure constructions and we did find in Portuguese, in Brazilian Portuguese, and we did find good enough effects, but we didn't really find effects on minimal attachment to structures such as main verb reduced to relative was not so strong. Like uh, Tom Bever's famous sentence, uh, the horse race, so he, he asked, did the horse race? And people said, no, it was raced. I mean, uh, now you're saying that uh, maybe it fits a role assignment. So when we have object, subject, kind, late closure kind of effect, people will assign first uh, patient fits a role. But th this goes the other way around with the main verb relative uh, uh, reduced relative clause. So we, you would assign. Um, uh, agents is a role and then would have to reanalyze it as a patient. Do you think there might be something like this involved? I mean, uh, is it easier maybe to assign in one direction and reassign in the other? I mean, I'm just thinking aloud about because we have uh, been trying to understand why we, did, we found this difference between main, uh, I, I mean, minimum attachment constructions and uh, relative clause, uh, and I mean, sorry, and uh, the other kind of subject object type of uh, late closure mm -hmm. constructions. I know if you have any thoughts. Yeah, about that. well, so I, what I, so that's one of the, at the end of, in the sort of future directions, when I said we're used, we've done so many experiments with this uh -huh. one construction, it really it would be useful to look at some others. Um, I think Kyle's lab has collected some data showing that with the, 
uh, minimal attachment ambiguity involving coordination mm -hmm. that you get misinterpretations. Mm -hmm. um, am I? It, That's correct. Yes. That, yeah. Correct. Uh, uh, and uh, they are easier to recover from the coordination uh, of ambiguities, uh, but they are uh, if if context supports the ambiguity, the the kind of the garden path interpretation, uh, they're not as easy to recover from. So they're you know kind of contextually dependent as well. Um, and we've also done uh, with the reduced relative uh, uh, garden paths and main verb and. Um, we get uh, some kind of you know, kind of stunningly low <laughs> accuracy effects on those, um, uh, and uh, not only stunningly low, but when uh, my my current doctoral student Jack Dempsey, uh, uh, part of his master's thesis and some continuing work, even when we uh, 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 have people read a number of these in a row and give a, a, a great amount of kind of implicit feedback as to what their structure should be. So including comprehension questions. Uh, uh, and then uh, um, uh, in one case, even the sentences with, that were, that were uh, reduced relative clauses in a different colored font versus the ones that were not reduced relative sentences uh, that, that, that were disambiguated. Um, people later on still get then they're given a whole bunch. They're given more of these reduced relatives in, you know, not the reduced, not the, the same color font, but the, the font that pointed out the fact that they were all kind of the same thing doesn't help them later on even. Yes. So um, they're, they're not terribly, uh, 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 they're not good at picking up on these kind of extra linguistic cues even. So um, it's interesting. And in, I don't know the syntax of Brazilian Portuguese uh, uh, well enough to say anything about it, but, but I do know that, the, so kind of building on, on Fernanda's uh, point about construal, um, th there, there is a kind of a, a a fuzzy syntactic sort of thing called, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, I wrote it down, e extra, position, extra positional, no, yeah, extra positional interpretation. So uh, you get syntactic things that are extraposed uh, occasionally in conversations, right? So um, something like, uh, 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 oh, Bill, Bill, Bill went, so imagine you're at, you know, you're at a house, you've got friends around, everyone's hungry, and you go, uh, Bill went to get some pizza. And uh, there's a couple of different possibilities. People are like, well, you know, and you say, Bill went to get some pizza. And you see people are like, oh, where? And you say, oh, at Pizza Hut. So that at Pizza Hut thing, mm -hmm. uh, or, or went, to the, went to get some pizza at Pizza Hut, right? So that's kind of like an extra thing that may or may not get associated into the, into the mm -hmm. structure. Or Bill went to get some and then you go, oh, pizza at Pizza Hut, right? It's so you just like kind of an afterthought. It's yeah. an afterthought, right? And these are kind of associated semantically to the, the previous thing. And mm -hmm. um, certain languages, uh, like the one I did my dissertation on, Odawa, which is an Algonquian language in, in uh, spoken in, in indigenous North America, um, uh, allows for a uh, 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 pro drop, so dropping both subjects and objects. Um, of all of all constructions, and you can essentially just get a verb phrase with a lot of null pronouns. And sometimes in conversations, people do this because it's clear in their head what they want to say, but it's not necessarily clear what they've said that the, that their interlocutor is the same idea in their head, right? And so, very often in uh, in the experiments that I ran in this language, uh, some of this is published, some of it's not. Um, uh, Things were interpreted as, you know, uh, the verb phrase, uh, uh, third person, bit third person. And then uh, 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 you could then choose, if it wasn't clear, to say dog cat or dog person or something like that. And uh, the, the speakers of this language would report this extrapositional interpretation. It's like, yeah, we know that the sentence is just the verb phrase and there's nothing there. You know, you drop the subject, the, 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 the arguments but the dog cat bit is just thrown on the end to clarify who did what, because we know that, or, you know, say dog man, the dog's usually by people and not the other way around, right? So they kind of just put that on the end extra positionally. So there's a, I mean, depending on the language, uh, 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 right. cer certain sorts of underspecifications might be more felicitous given right. structures and the, the flexibility that the morphosyntax of the language may allow. <laughs> 
That's right. But you you just said, Professor, that uh, you found it in English as well, right? Yeah. Yes. So this, this thing does yeah, happen. Uh, Lynn yeah. Frazier and I did a series of kind of experiments right. uh, mm -hmm. when I was at UMass doing a, a postdoc uh, mm -hmm. and, and looked at this sort of thing. And people were consistent with how they associated it. And it seemed to be, you know, a, a, a standard thing that people did, but it was it was not, you know, kind of syntactically, there was no kind of clear syntactic connection to the sentence, to the utterance, but it, 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 uh, they were interpreted just fine. I think also like when we go at the beginning or the earlier part of my talk, I brought up the um, Frere and Clifton study and then the McDonald Justin Carpenter study, which was not the, the, oh, right. both of those predate yeah. good, good enough oh. processing, but were done in, they were done in English. And um, if you ask subjects like in the McDonald's at all study, the soldiers warned about the dangers conducted the midnight raid. Mm -hmm. Did the soldiers warn somebody? Right. You saw in those air raids, the Carnegie Mellon undergraduates were saying uh, yes, a very high percentage of, of the high, high percentage of the, the time. Mm -hmm. So there's something about, so I don't think it's a minimal attachment late closure split. Right. Um, I think it's something to do with the severity of the garden path. And for English speakers, the reduced relative structure is really brutal. And in fact, we recently did a, a, a replication of Frere and Clifton in my lab with like better ends, better material, you know, not really better materials because we wanted it to be a replication. Um, but we gave our undergraduates these same sentences that we had given them way, way back in the 80s. 1985, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a long time ago. And those subjects, and our subjects, hate reduced relatives, they essentially find them ungrammatical. So there might be something happening in terms of dialects, um, mm. and maybe there's something happening with linguistic change, with some people are rejecting the reduced relative form. But I think the basic, you know, the, the uh, you make me realize there's a, an implicit assumption in all of this that could be tested systematically, which is the severity of the garden path is going to correlate with the strength of the misinterpretation effect. So if you had a metric for the severity of the garden path, you could line that up with the amount of evidence you have that people have misinterpreted the sentence. The greater the garden path, the more likely a misinterpretation is gonna happen. And in some languages, like it looks like in American English at least, reduced relatives induce such a garden path that people can't even really get the structure. Maybe there's something about Portuguese, a Brazilian Portuguese in particular, that that licenses the reduced relative structure and makes it easier for people mm. to figure out that this initial NP is not serving an uh, agent-like role, but is instead the theme or patient of the action. Okay, thank you very much for your thoughts. Well, I will still have a few questions here in the chat. Um, there's uh, Gabriela Zurino says she is a regular reader of your work, and uh, she's worried about the uh, the effect of prior word knowledge during sentence comprehension, and uh, she would like to hear you a little bit about that because uh, there are these effects like they may get mixed up. Uh, with uh, semantics and syntactic analysis, what, how, maybe you could talk a little bit more about word knowledge. That's what she's actually asking. It's just to make sure, word, W-O-R-D or W-O-R-L-D? Mundo, world. <laughs> Mundo, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> world knowledge, yeah, That's right. Fine. So um, we, it's the, World knowledge plays a major role. Again, the stronger the garden path, the more likely you are to misinterpret the, and misinterpret, the, and misinterpret the sentence. So you remember the example of the baboon grooming the chimp versus the baboon grooming the tiger. Um, it's not the syntax and it's nothing really about linguistic processing that tells you not to be garden pathed in the case of the baboon grooming the tiger. In, Instead, it's just your world knowledge that not good things are going to happen if a baboon tries to groom a tiger. So that's a very unlikely scenario, which, depending on how you look at parsing, would make it so that either the parser never even bothers to try to make the tiger the object, or it um, 
does so because, but then quickly reanalyzes that. And again, the less you've been committed to the wrong interpretation, the less the, the weaker that misinterpretation is going to be. So world knowledge is part of what is um, helping the parser to obtain the right interpretation of these sentences. And it then will, when you've got these floating interpretations, like let's just say for the sake of argument that you do actually build a structure where the baboon is grooming the tiger, you actually do build that clause. And then you reanalyze that really quickly. Um, it, the, the, that initial interpretation that's floating around in your working memory that says baboon groomed tiger, your system goes, yeah, that's just not good. Whatever, th that can't be what the sentence is about. So you're less likely to misinterpret the sentence. Um, and in the experiments that, um, that Kyle was the lead author on in, in that 2001 paper, which I always forget to point out, that paper started as a class project um, and yielded the pilot data that then let, turned into the major paper. Anyway, um, in that experiment, you saw that if the deer is pacing in the zoo, people are much less likely to misinterpret the sentence. And that's their world knowledge, which is telling them that um, an interpretation that they have in their head where the man is hunting a deer and the deer is pacing in a zoo, that that is not, that doesn't make sense. And that they should, um, now here, the, you know, this is a really interesting question that's been asked because, you know, how then does that world knowledge tell the parser to, make sure to make that subordinate clause intransitive so that the object is um, unspecified. Um, but yeah, but world knowledge is clearly playing a role in the extent to which these misinterpretations linger in memory. Okay, Professor Kyle would like to say something about that, the role yeah. of word. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, so, so, it, uh, kind of echoing what Fernando says, it, it would it it this this uh, uh, that finding kind of suggests this uh, 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 kind of this overwriting of the original semantic interpretation is 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 what's really critical here because it would be I'm not sure what the mechanism would be for world knowledge to go back in and talk to the syntactic parser and say hey uh, change that structure as opposed to there's a, a couple of competing semantic analyses existing and then world knowledge comes on one of the reasons we we we, we did that that manipulation is uh uh, uh, uh traxler and and pickering had um uh, uh a couple years earlier done something like well while, while mary mended the sun set in the west or something like that versus well mary mended the sock fell from her lap and saw that the mending the sun kind of blocked the interpretation uh, right because it's not only implausible but Im impossible perhaps mm -hmm. right so um and and so we were wondering uh if if we put that that implausibility further downstream if you'd get a similar sort of effect um and and it's true so it's not just a matter of you know wrong word wrong place it's you know right word right place but then something kind of wrong information comes later on and you still get a very similar sort of effect of this of this kind of uh uh overwriting or replacing or inhibit uh, in, inhibition of the uh, of the incorrect kind of semantic analysis. Um, yeah. That's right, very interesting. <laughs> um, great discussions, nice talk. Uh, uh, people are saying that, uh, thank you very much for your answers. That was exactly the question. Okay. Um, but the problem is that sometimes lexical semantics and the word knowledge are treated equally and they are not. Well, okay, that's right. Um, maybe if we still have a few minutes left, I would like to hear you a bit, Fernanda, on your next work, you mentioned good enough in production. I was really a bit puzzled because <laughs> usually when you produce, you know, you have planned it and uh, you probably, I would say probably, you wouldn't be garden pathed on your own sentence, right? I thought, to, I, I tend to think of it more as a comprehension 
problem, but uh, mm -hmm. I was so curious if you could tell us something about it. Well, maybe what I'll do is I'll just say a couple of quick things about it, but not okay. too much because I right. I would I would like to to let Adele also have her um you know her, give her spin on this and and actually I need to go in a couple of minutes um but I um but it's very interesting what you've just said because that's actually where Adele and I start in our paper is like. You might think that the idea of good enough production is crazy. What would that even mean? You know, we have the semantic intention and then we run it through the production system and we articulate, um, uh, produce an utterance that reflects what we wanted to say. Um, and Kay Bach pointed out many, many years ago in one of her earliest, uh, in her like, I think her first psych review paper that um, you can fake, as, a, as I mentioned in my talk, you can pretend to have understood somebody, um, but you can't pretend to speak the language, you know? So my comprehension of Portuguese is way, way better than my production of Portuguese, right? I can, um, and I'm not pretending either when I comprehend it, um, but speaking, you have to get all the details right. So yeah, what do we mean by good enough production? By the end, Adele and I were like, oh my gosh, we hope this proposal isn't trivial because everything is good enough production when we think about it from the perspective that we eventually came up with. So just to give you a, one example, um, I'll give you two quick examples. So one is um, the work that, that Adele and her colleagues have done on children's use of, uh, of, you know, how a child will refer to a horse as a dog. And we think, you know, we call that an overextension um, but it actually turns out that if you probe the child's knowledge, the child will not call, will will and it show them a dog and a horse and say which is the dog. They'll point to the dog. They they know their competence is such that they know that that isn't a dog. That the horse isn't a dog. But in that moment when the child is talking, the accessibility of dog is much better than the you know they have greater access to this term. And so good enough production says in the situation just call it the thing that you can think of right now because you know we're talking here and we don't have time to search through our whole memory system trying to find the exact right word and adults actually do this um, a lot if you if you listen to casual conversations you'll see people sort of using a good enough term to refer to an object because in that moment they can't retrieve the more accurate term um, so that's one example and accessibility in general um, is part of what we believe underlies good enough production Another example that we spend time on is our the work that we did, and this was Ben Sweats, um, who came up earlier in the questions, that Ben Sweats and uh, some others of us did on resumptive pronouns. And recently, Adam Morgan and Victor Ferreira have been doing some really lovely work on sentences where there's a, an island violation and subjects plug in a resumptive pronoun. So um, both, uh, our lab and Adam Morgan and his work, you could, we've successfully elicited sentences like, um, this is a cat that I don't know what it does, or this, right? The, and these are sentences that are in some sense ungrammatical. You know, there's a debatable whether they're ungrammatical, but certainly we know people don't like them. If you ask people to rate the grammaticality of something like the, uh, Kyle has a great example. Um, I like to eat the kinds of foods that I don't know what they are. You hear these things all the time. Um, and we argue that that's another example of good enough production. And in that case, it's really interesting that the in, in uh, you're coming up against a constraint of the grammar where the, there's really no better way to say that thing. It, there's no really optimal grammatical way to say this is a you know, this is a cat and I don't know what it eats. In fact, in our experiment, we set up these six, a situation where subject had to say some things like that. About 30% of the time, that's the sub sentence that people would produce. And I remember we had one clever subject who came up with, this is a cat whose food preferences are unknown to me, right? So, you know, you have to really kind of dig around. So you end up producing something that's marginal or semi-grammatical um, in order to express your communicative intention. But it's good enough, you understand, uh, you know, when Kyle says, I like to eat the kinds of foods that I don't know what they are, I know exactly what he means. But it's not, uh, you know, it's not optimal 
So we have other kind of cases like that, but I hope that sort of um, what's your appetite for the, yeah, Very for good. the argument. Lots. And when you think about things like speech errors and um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, production <clears throat> in your L2 and so you see that actually good enough production is kind of the way it, it, it works. And, um, you know, in this talk today, I felt like I was, you know, I, I, you know, mon as you're self monitoring, I'm like, oh, that, that was not so great. You know, that wasn't the most optimal way of describing that, uh, that concept. Right? So interesting. Thank you very much. Lots of food for thought. <laughs> so I think uh, we, we just got to the end of our talk tonight. Thank you very much, Fernanda, for sharing your research with us. Also, Professor Christensen, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Pleasure bye -bye. to see you, everyone. Bye.